We're going to go through 1 Samuel 17, and we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. We're going to, we're going to learn today how to defeat Goliath, whoever and whatever that Goliath may be in your life. Even though he may be as big as this Goliath is to this little David, and Goliath was a giant. I don't know if he was quite this big in stature in comparison to, that, to David, but he was a big guy. I mean, this guy looks like he's 30 feet tall. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, spiritually speaking, the demons that we come up against, they can appear like they're 30 feet tall, you know, um, in conjunction with, with uh, our size, weight, and the little power that we have, you know. But with Yah, you know, we have everything we need. And let's jump right in. First Samuel. First uh, Samuel's. 17.1, and it reads, it says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Yahuda, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah and Esphesdamim. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to take a look at some of these uh, meanings of some of these terms. Um, we have the Philistines, which means immigrants. You know, an immigrant is someone who goes somewhere else and set up shop permanently. <laughs> they're not just visiting, they're not planning, they coming in, but they're not planning on leaving, you know. And Shoko means defense. Yahuda speaks to those that praise Yah. Hallelujah. Azekah means tilled, dug over, to grub over, to dig up by the roots even. Espezdam mean, means the edge or the end of blood. You know, so if we look at this thing on, on a spiritual note, we can see that the immigrants, you know, um, well, let's first of all, let's define the land, spiritually speaking. Spiritually speaking, we can look at, we can look at our bodies as, as the land, because truly they are a type of land being made from the dust of the earth, I mean, you know, so we can look at our bodies as a type of land, and those, you know, once we're followed from above, i.e. born again, that new creature in Yah, inherits this land you know it inherits these flesh bodies you know when we're followed from above you know that new man inherits these flesh bodies and there's there's philistines there's enemies within these flesh bodies there's philistines dwelling in these flesh bodies that done came in set up shop and they not planning to ever leave you know they planning on being there from here on you know, spiritually speaking, this may look like a smoking habit. It may look like a crack habit. It may look like a cocaine habit. It may look like a drinking habit. You know, any other vices of the world that, that done set up shop in your flesh and don't want to leave. You know, for me, it was a gambling habit. You know, that was, that was my Philistine. You know, he had, he had been there for quite a while. You know, and Shoko... Now take note that it says, now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and they were gathered together at Shoko. See, they're going to come and, you know, they, they recognize that, you know, now that, that you have this, this new man within, within the um, land, you know, this new man, he's not without armor, because we have our gospel armor, I mean. You know, so they see this new man, and they see him with this armor on, so they're going to come and test him. They come to Shoko, they come to, to, to the defense and to, to where the, the defenses are, you know, for this new man. It's, it's, you know, we, we want to, you know, we don't really want you here. We don't want you here. See, because they understand that, you know, we have instructions to annihilate them. You know, when Yah sent his people into the land, he told them, don't make no treaties. Don't make no contracts. You know, don't, don't, um, don't be friendly. Don't befriend the, the folks that's in the land. Totally annihilate them. See, and when we're father from above, we're supposed to annihilate everything that's in the land that is not of Yah. We're supposed to tear down their altars, the things that they that they look up to, the things that they worship. We're supposed to tear down. We're supposed to destroy. 
See, and if we were to do that, you know, we would be, we would be uh, real tight in Yah's eyesight. We'll be, he, he'll take care of us. You know, we we'll, if we er just eradicate all the enemies out the land, if we don't make no treaties, no contracts with them, if we don't allow them to rule over us, if we don't enter into marriage with them. See, that's the whole problem, you know, spiritually speaking. You know, one gets fathered from above, i.e. born again, and then they want to come into, you know, they have this new creature that's supposed to be in Yah, and they, he comes into this land, and, and they want to make they want to make treaties and contracts. They want to marry off in, with these uh, with these spiritual beings that's, that's within the land, with these these vices, if you would. You know, you know, the drunk only want to want to only want to drink on the weekends. While I cut back, you know, it's gonna take time. You know, uh, I'm not gonna smoke crack every day. I'm just gonna smoke crack every now and again, just on the first and fifteen. Well, <laughs> you know, see, we're totally annihilate these things from out the land. You know, so they're gonna come up. At, they're gonna come at us. You know, together at Shoko, at wherever we think our defenses are, which belong to Yahuda. See, these are the defenses of Yahuda. Yahuda are those that praise Yah. So this is that new man, this new creature that's within this, within the land, within these flesh bodies. You know, that give the praises to Yah. This is where they're gonna come and attack us at. You know, and they're gonna pitch between between our defenses and Azakah. You know. As a cause speaks to something that's tilled over, something that's dug over, something that, that's that's dug up by the roots. See, because you know, we, we go in and we try to take these vices and we try to dig them up by the roots. But how many of you ever tried to pull a weed up out of something? You know, and you thought you had it all, but next thing you know, here it is coming right back again. You know, see, and th this is what this is what happens, you know, in Azakai. You know, the stuff that you done dug up, the stuff that you have determined to dig up, I should say. The stuff that you have determined, you know, that Yah has instructed you to dig up by the roots. You know, this is where the enemy comes because they don't want to go. So the roots, the um, weeds, they will fight you. The immigrants in the land, they will fight you because they don't want to be annihilated. They don't want to be dug up by the roots. They, wanna, they, they will fight you to the bitter end. You know, and here it is. They'll pitch between Azekai uh, and Shoko, you know, because they're not trying to be plucked up by the, by the roots. You know, see, but this battle takes place in Esfesdami, which is the edge or the end of blood. In other words, it's not in the fleshly realm, it's in the spiritual realm. It's where the blood ceases and the spirit begins. This is where the battle takes place at. You know, so we, we, we see this picture here. And scripture is painting a very vivid picture for us, you know, of what we will come up against when we're father from above, when we're, i.e., born again. You know, it's not, it's, it's not you just come into, you know, you inherit this land, you come into this land, and everything is just hunky dory, and, and all the enemies just go, go wow. away. Wow. No, it doesn't work like that. You know, we're going to have to fight. We're going to have to fight just like the natural Israelites had to fight, so will the spiritual Israelites have to fight. First the natural, then the spiritual. 1 Samuel 17, 2 says, And Shaul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched in the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now, they're in the, they pitched by the valley of Elah. Elah means an oak. It means strength. You know, so Shaul and the men of Israel, and Shaul, by the way, his name means desired or desires. You know, so this speaks of one's desires. And the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah. Elah. You know, so here it is. You know, you're going to fight where you're strong at, you know, in the valley of strength. In the valley of an oak, this is oaks are known for being very, very old trees, you know. So this is this is this is where the old stuff at, where the where the strong stuff at, you know. And this is where our battle takes place, you know. And so here it is. Our Shaul, our desire, 
is to do Yah's will. You know, 1 Samuel 17, 3 tells us, And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. Okay, so you got the picture now. Here it is on one side. You have you have you have you have Israel. On the other side, you have the Philistines. To put it another way, on one side you have the new man, i.e. the spirit man. On the other side, you have have the, 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 the spirits, the unclean spirits that exist in the land. That's in our flesh that we have to come up against. Can I have my first reader read? First Samuel 17, 4 through 10, please. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and one bearing a shield went before him and he stood and cried out to the armies of israel and said unto them why are ye come out to set your battle in array Am I am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Shaul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel. This day, give me a man that we may fight together. Okay, so here it is, we have we have a duel being proposed. You know, Goliath is proposing that, you know, a duel to the death. Whoever wins, the one serves the other. You know, if you lose then you serve us, and if we lose then we serve thee. Now, Goliath is a very important character in Scripture in that he's one of only three characters in Scripture that actually has the mark of the beast that Revelation speaks of uh, upon his character, upon his, uh, his story. And, of course, that the number of, uh, of that beast is 666, 666. And here with Goliath, we see that he was six cubits, um, six cubits uh, tall. His height was six cubits. He had six pieces of um, of armor, a helmet of brass, a coat of mail, greaves of brass, target of brass, uh, the the staff of his spear. So he had his spear, and he had his shield, which gives us another six. And then his uh, the weight of of his the weight of iron or the, the shekels of iron uh, for his spearhead was 600 shekels. So we have 606. Six. Mm. You know, there's only three characters that you can find that number, you know, within within their their stories. And, and Goliath is one of them. Nebuchadnezzar is another. And Solomon is another. You know, and they represent the three aspects of that B system that speak that's spoken of in Revelation. But that being said, Goliath represents the military aspect, the might, the muscle, you know, the one that's, that's gonna, that forces folks to do stuff, you know. And notice Goliath is from Gath. Gath means wine press, you know, so Goliath, he's the champion of Gath. He's the champion of the wine press. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen a wine press, but just imagine a vice. You know, when you put something into a vice, it, it just squeezes all the life out of you. You know, it, it speaks of a very, of, a, of oppression. A very strong oppression that just continually squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. 
Okay, so here it is, spiritually speaking, we have this giant that we're going to have to deal with. Yes, there's giants in the land. When you're father from above, the giants don't just run away. They're still become, they're still giants in the land. Anyone who's ever been addicted to anything know what it is to deal with a giant. You know, I was addicted to gambling. That, that was my Goliath. You know, everyone, when their father from above, I believe, will encounter a giant in their life. Or some giants in their life. And Goliath is always the one that that has that comes to you as a as a youth. You know, they they've been around for a long time, you know, and you know, they've grown a lot of strength. They know you better than you know yourself. You know, they know just what buttons to push and when to push them. You know, so we have to be very careful. So we need to learn how to slay Goliath. You know, so here it is. We see here uh, in verse 8, it tells us that Goliath stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out and set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? I'm an immigrant. I'm over, over here in your land. and set up shop. I'm not going nowhere. You know, ye are servants to Shaul. See, ye are servants to Shaul. You get that? Ye are servants to Shaul. Shaul means desires. Ye are servants to Shaul. Choose a man for you and let him come down to me if he be able to fight with me wow. and to kill me. Then will we be your servants. See, you, you don't, you don't want to go, well, we'll get into that in, in a minute. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye be our servants. And trust and believe, if Goliath win this battle, you will serve him. Spiritually speaking, you will serve him. This is why you have some, some addicts that still remain addicts today, even after they've been quote-unquote saved. See, because you have to fight this battle. And you have to overcome. You have to slay Goliath. If you don't slay Goliath, he will slay you. And you'll serve, you'll serve him all your days. 1 Samuel 17, 11, and 12 says, When Shaul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephratite of Bethlehem, Yehuda, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Shaul. Okay, now David, his name means beloved. You know, that's who we want to be in the story. We want to be David. We want to be the beloved of Elohim. Amen. We want to be an Ephratite, a man of Ephraim. That means a man that's producing fruit. You know, for Yah Yahushua, our Messiah, would tell us, you know, that we're to bear much fruit. Because if we're not, we don't bear much fruit, then we'll be cut from the vine. So we want to be beloved, the beloved of Elohim. They bear fruit. You know, and they are of Bethlehem, Yahuda, they are of the house of bread of those who praise Yah. And we know who the house of bread is. Even our Messiah, Yahushua, who would tell us that he is the bread of life. Amen. Yes, he means Yah exists, the great I am. You know, Yah does exist, and then and and we're to we're to be his beloved son. So spiritually speaking, those of us who are father from above, we're father from Yahuwah. You know, we know he exists. You know, we are to be beloved. We are to go on. We are to bear fruit. And we're to ever be of the house of bread. That is, doing the teachings and instructions of, of Yahushua, our master, our Adonai. And we're to ever be giving praise to Yah. 1 Samuel 17, 13 says, And the three eldest sons of Yesi went and followed Shaul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. Now Eliab, his name means El is father. Abinadab means father of willingness. And Shammah means astonishment or, or bewilderment. See, now they were following Shaul to the battle. 
You know, and yes, they knew that Elohim was their father, but that's not enough. They knew that Elohim was willing to stand in for them, but they were also astonished or bewildered by what was going on. See, and we don't want to be like that. And we definitely don't want to be following Shaul to the battle. We don't want to be following our desires to the battle. You know, because then you're fighting for the wrong reason. Amen? Now it says, and David was the youngest. And the three elders followed Shaul. You know, so in the beginning... This is what this is telling us, scripturally, um, spiritually speaking, it's telling us in the beginning, you know, we're going to be following Shaul too. You know, but we don't want, we want to learn the lesson here so that we don't make the same mistakes. We don't want to follow Shaul. We want to be as David. He's the hero of the story. So we want to always, you know, identify with him. So we learn what not to do. We learn not to follow our desires. You know, because... These, des these desires will get you in trouble. And you see, those who followed the desires, they were still afraid. They were scared. 1 Samuel 17, 15, and 16 says, But David went and returned from Shaul. See, he, he returned from Shaul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Okay, so this is telling us that when, even when we're father from above, you know, and we are, we, we, we become that beloved son of Elohim, you know, and we inherit this land, that i.e. these flesh bodies, and, and we encounter the, the enemies that's in the land, the giants that's in the land, the Philistines, the immigrants that done came into this flesh and set up shop and don't want to leave. We'll see that morning and evening they'll be presenting themselves to us for 40 days. The 40 speaks to test trials and probation. So there's going to be a testing. There's going to come a time when these Philistines, when the enemies that's within this flesh is going to come up against us to test us. To try us. And we have to know this. See, this is, this is something that was prophesied long ago. When we look at Judges chapter 3, 1 through 4, it speaks of this. It says, now these are the nations which Yahuwah left to prove Israel by them. See, they were left, you know, Yah, he destroyed some of the things. When Yahushua came to the earth, he destroyed many of the unclean. You know, but, by, but these unclean spirits, he destroyed many. But by the time he left, he didn't destroy them all. Even as Joshua didn't destroy all the inhabitants of the land. Why? Some was left there to prove Israel. Even as many of Israel that had not known the wars of Canaan. See, because everyone hands is going to have to have to go to war. So you can't just ride off to the coattails of those that preceded you. This is why Yah leaves them in the land so that he might prove Israel, even those who have not known all the wars of Canaan. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. See, Yah, he wants, he's raising up an army. You know, and, and we're going to have to fight. You know, so he leaves these, these immigrants, these nations, in the land. So when the one that's followed from above and here at the land, you know, he has his work cut out for him already. You know, I know it sounds like a negative, but it's actually a positive. Yah approves us so so that so he can bless us. Verse 3, Judges 3 3 says, namely, five lords of the Philistines. He left he left five lords of the Philistines in the land. And all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwell in Mount Lebanon. Lebanon speaks of the white mountain or the nation of the righteous, spiritually speaking. Yeah, these are the ones that's in the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. These are the ones that's, that's up in there. These are the wolves and sheep clothing. These are, these are the, the, the um, tares amongst the wheat, if you would. They're not so obvious. 
They don't stick out like a sore giant, like a sore thumb, like Goliath the giant. Now it says that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon to the entering of Hamath. And there were they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken to the commandments of Yahuwah. See, this is what Yah is ultimately trying to find out. He's trying to find out beforehand, before you carry your tail into the kingdom of Elohim, you know, he wants to know, hey, are you going to follow my commandments or not? So he's going to test you while you're in this wilderness. And he's going to purge any and everything that is not of him up out of you. So he says that they were there. He left them there to prove Israel by them to know whether or not they were hearken unto the commandments of Yahuwah, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moshe. You know, who are these five lords of the Philistines? Well, Joshua 13, 3 for, um, is one place where they're, they're identified. It says, from Sehor, which is before Mizraim or Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekron, northward, which is counted to the Canaanite, five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites, the Ashdothites, uh, the Escalonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, and also the Avites, which are the same as the Hivites, actually. Now, Ashdod means powerful. Gaza means stronghold. Ascalon means a wane place. Gath, again, means wine press. And Ekron means eradication. See, and this is how they, this is how these, these inhabitants of the land, they'll come at us, they'll come at us powerfully and, and, and try to, try to catch us up in their strongholds. They'll take us to their wane place. They're going to put us on their scales to see what we truly value. They're going to see what we truly value. What we truly give the most weight to. Do we give the most weight to Yah or do we give the most weight to them? What do you really value? And then they're going to, of course, you have the Gathites such as Goliath, as we're speaking about, that, that speaks to the wine press of those, they're just going to try to squeeze you. They're just going to try to squeeze you. They're just going to oppress you. And if they can, they're going to they're gonna put an uh, Ekron on you and eradicate you. While you're trying to eradicate them, they're going to try to eradicate you. You know, you, we ride by and we see, you know, folks on the, on the corners and, and you know, and, and and in the neighborhoods, and we know that they done been there for a whole lifetime. Could they have been taken to Ekron? Could they have been eradicated? Would the inhabitants of the land just run rampant and destroy the newborn from out of the land, destroy Israel from out of the land, rather than Israel destroying them out of the land? You know, so this is something that we have to take into consideration because these are our enemies and this is how they'll come at us. Also in the land are the Canaanites. Canaanites means merchants. They speak, the Canaanites speak to merchants. You know, the Canaanites were the merchants of the ancient land and they were travelers and, and they sold any and everything. And, and it's real important to understand where they come into play because they represent the cares of this world, uh, the things that you want. And the Sidonians, Sidonians, you know, their name means hunters or fishers. Fishers, they were gathered. They were, um, they they literally caught stuff. You know, they hunted it or 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 um, trapped it and snared it. You know, so the Sidonians, that's what they'll try to do. They'll try to ensnare you. Remember how Baalim, um, Baalim um, was uh he was hired to ensnare Israel, got them to serve other, other gods. You know, yes, that's what we want to think of when we start thinking of, of the Sidonians. They're going to try to catch you up. And the Hivites, the Hivites, uh, which is the, the, um, 
They speak to actually their name means life giving or, or villagers. You know, this speak to your own family and friends. This speak to your, the peers that you grew up with. That's right. That's that's been around you all your life. That you may look up to. That you may respect. Even though they're not a yah. You know, so this is how the enemy going to come at us, spiritually speaking. The same way they came at Israel, physically speaking. You know, that the um, way that they will come at us is entailed within the story. It's entailed within the word. This is how they'll come at us on a spiritual um, note. Let me have my next reader read First Samuel 17, 17 through 23. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for the brethren an ephod of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to their brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how their brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning, and left the sheep with their keeper, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the, to the flight, fight, and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array army against army, and David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and ran into the army, and came, and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Okay, recall if you would, that when David's brothers went and followed Shaul, that is, followed the desires that David, he was taking care of the sheep, his father's sheep. You know, and this is a spiritual picture that, you know, here it is, when you follow from above, i.e. born again, that, that your responsibility is to look after the sheep. That is, look after the sheep of Elohim. You know, we're to make sure that they are okay. You know, but then there's going to come a time when our Heavenly Father is going to send us to those who are fighting for their desires. There's going to come a time, and He's going to He's going to He's going to send with us parched corn. That is, and and ten loaves. The ten the parched corn speaks to the teachings and instructions of Elohim. The ten loaves speaks to His Torah. Same thing with the ten cheeses speaks. To his Torah, the number 10 represents long responsibility. You know, so here it is. We see that we want to make certain that, you know, our brethren that, that surround us, that we know and love, that they are adhering to the teaching and instruction of Yah and taking the responsibility of Yah's Torah and those who are in charge of them. We want to make sure, certain also that they, likewise, you know, are acknowledging Torah in their lives because if you have a wicked leader then you know that's going to cause you know uh, that's going to that could cause you to come to your demise you know so here it is you know David's father yes he was a, was a smart man he, he's, he's sending provision not only for his brethren but for their captains too you know it's, hey kind of kind of an incentive to look out for his sons. You know, it says in 19, now Shaul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Eli fighting with the with the Philistines. See, now, we see them actually in the in the valley now. First, it was one was on, on one mountain and the other one was on the other mountain with the valley in between them, right? You know, see, now, this is what, you know, it's a great spiritual lesson to be learned here, see, because the enemy will always attack you in the valley. That is, the enemy will always attack you at your lowest point. He's not going to attack you when you're at your highest point. He's going to attack you when you're at your lowest point. That's when he's going to come up against you. That's when you're going to have to have to fight the hardest. You see, they don't play fair. You know, this is war. 
they're going to attack you in the valley at your lowest point. And their champion is Goliath. And his name means exile. You know, and, and this is what he'll this is what he'll attempt to attack you with. Exile. You hear believers all the time say, Oh man, you know, I you know, this is this is a lonely walk. You know, um, exile comes from Gala, which means the denude. And this is another way that he attacks you. He starts stripping you of your stuff that you thought you needed. You know, start stripping you and making you bare of all the things that you thought you had to have, you know, till you just look like, uh, or look like just a, a smidgen of what you used to look like or what you used to be. You know, totally change you. His name can also mean splendor. And that's, an, that's how, how he attacks you. He attacks you at your splendor. You know, the, the thing that you were noted for, the thing that, that everyone looked to you for, you know, he'll tear that down. The things that defined you when you were in the world, he'll tear that down. He'll make you bear. You know, he'll take everything. You'll feel like you've been exiled. See, this is the type of warfare that, that they come at you with. A lot of people, you know, they give in to this. You know, they can't handle it. You know, they used to, the recognition that they used to get from the world, and when they start following Yah, it's just like, no more recognition. You know, they find themselves bare in exile with nothing but Yah. And that's just where Yah wants you. You know, but the enemy try to use that against you, try to tell you, you know, it, look, you, you're doing something wrong. It's not supposed to be like this. You know, something, something not right. See, that's how the enemy, he'll come. He, you know, spiritually speaking, he'll come and he, that's how he'll attack you. See, but we have to learn to defeat Goliath. Let me have my next reader read verses 24 through 30 of First Samuel 17. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the men, fled from him, and they were so afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that come up? Surely to defy Israel he is come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Then, and David spoke to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living Elohim? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke, when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride, and in the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down, that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I done? What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again, and again after the former manner. Okay, so here it is. We see David going down here and learning what's going on. You know, hearing Goliath, you know, throw his spill out there and seeing all the men of Israel cower, you know, say when they saw the man, they fled from him and were so afraid. Here it is, they running from him. You know, and all the men of Israel, they, they saying, have you seen this man that has come up? This guy is huge. Surely to defy Israel, he has come up. 
You know, but it was also said that it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So there's a little incentive there, you know, for, for slaying Goliath. You know, and, and, and David began to, to question and ask about this, you know, who is this cat that he, he should defy the armies of the living Elohim? Don't we know who we are? See, and that's the whole problem. A lot of us don't know who we are. You know, we have to be like the beloved. We have to know who we are. Who is this cat to defy the armies of Elohim? You know, and his oldest brother, he get upset with him. You know, you just come down here to be nosy. What about those few sheep in the wilderness? <laughs> See, but that's, you know, that's how, that's how it goes, though. You know, see, y'all, he take the least and make, make them the greatest. He take the one over a few and make them the greatest. He said he chose Israel not because they, they were the, the largest nation in the world, but because they were the smallest, because they was the least. You know, he take the foolish and confound the wise. So here it is. David hears what's going on. And, you know, David's talking real strong concerning Goliath. And, and then, you know, the word gets back to Shaul. My next reader, um, 1731 through 37. And when the words were heard which David spake, they, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent, him, sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of it, because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and they came a lion, and there came a lion and a bear, and took the lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has filled, defiled the armies of the living Elohim. David said, moreover, Yahuwah that delivered me out of the out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and Yahuwah be with thee. As a roaring lion and oh, a that's good. Hallelujah. See, that's the, that's the way we're supposed to be. Even as David, the beloved of Elohim, we know no fear. We know no fear. Hallelujah. When everybody else is running, you know, David said to Shaul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. You know, and, and, and Shaul, you know, being the coward that he was, you know, at this point, but, but you just a youth. Yeah, we may be just used in the spiritual realm. We are just used. But we're the children of the Most High El. You know, even though our enemy is a man of war from his youth, we are the children of the Most High El. See, and Yah has us over there tending to these few little sheep so that we can learn the lessons that we need to learn. So when he sent us to the battle, we'll be ready. You know, so here it is, we see David, you know, saying, yeah, thy servant kept thy, his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear, and I took a lamb out of the, uh, and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and I smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. You know what I'm saying? You see me wrestling with a bear, pour honey on me. I'm not scared. And his 
this uncircumcised Philistine should be as one of them, seeing that he hath defied the armies of the living Elohim. That be said, moreover, Yahuwah that delivered me out of the part of uh, out of the part of the lion and out of the part of the, of the bear, he'll deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. See, and that's the, that's the important thing. See, the beloved of Elohim recognizes that it's not us. It's not. It's not him. It's Yah who will deliver. It's Yah. See, that's what he learned by watching those little, those few little sheep. That Yah has his back. That Yah will deliver him from the lion. That Yah had delivered him from the bear. And that Yah will deliver him from this giant. You know, now, spiritually speaking, this lion and this bear speaks to a wicked ruler over Yah's people. We read in Proverbs 28, 15, as a roaring lion and a raging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. You know, so here it is. You know, this is when you're watching the sheep, you know, you're to help break their oppression off of the sheep. You to help them help get that wicked ruler out from over them. We know who that wicked ruler is, spiritually speaking. Amen. Even Hasatan, we get him out from over them. Show the people a more gracious, a more merciful ruler, even Yahuwah Elohim. In verses 38 through 40, it says, And Shaul armed David with his armor, and he put on a helmet of brass upon his head and also armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor and essayed to go. He hesitated. He hesitated. He said, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Shaul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. See, the child of Elohim is wise enough to know that you don't go off in the battle with nothing that you haven't proven. You know, you cannot take someone else's covering and put upon yourself. You can only go forth with the covering of Elohim. You can go only go forth with what he's done proven to you. And the only thing that we have that's proven of Elohim is his word. So that's the only thing that we can cover ourselves with when we go out to battle. We can't put on the armor of our desires. Our money is not going to save us. Our cars are not going to save us. Our goods and the cares of this world is not going to save us. No. See, the only thing that's going to save us is that which has proven itself in our lives time and time again. And that is the word of Elohim. Oh, yeah. So we're going to have to be as David in the spiritual war. And we're going to have to take these things off. We're going to have to take our, the, the things that our desires gave us, we're going to have to take them off in order to go forward. Yeah, I know you want those things, but sometimes you got to take them off. You know, because you can always get it again. And it says that he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. See, now this is real. This is a real important part of the lesson because this is this is what we need. This is the weaponry that we that we're gonna go into battle with. So we have to know and understand, you know, what's being told here. The shepherd's staff speaks to being a teacher as well. It speaks to a teacher as well as a pupil, and it speaks to an understanding heart. See, it just depends on which end of the staff that you're on. If you're on the end of the staff that's uh, and, and being goaded, then you're the pupil. Now, if you're the one doing the goading, then you're the teacher. You know, but either way, you know, it will help you. Either way, for whatever end of the staff one is on, it depicts one having an understanding heart. It, whether you're the teacher or rather you're the student, because if you don't, if you're the student and you don't understand, you're going to keep getting goaded until you do. And if you're the teacher, then you're going to keep goading your pupil until they understand. So either way, it represents one that has an understanding heart. It can be a teacher or a pupil, such as a disciple of Yahushua, or a teacher of his word. You know, so we're to, have, we're to go out with our shepherd's staff. We have to make certain that we're either
teaching his word or we're a student of his word, if we don't have our shepherd's staff, then we need to stay where we are until we get it. Because we need that understanding heart. So don't go to battle without it. You know, and then we're going to need to get us five smooth stones out of the brook. Now five is the number of grace. And it represents grace. It's the number of grace or atonement. We have to make sure that we are atoned for by our L. We have to make sure that we're in his good grace. Now, we don't want to just get any old stones. We want smooth stones. Now, being smooth speaks to being made smooth by the water washing over it. See, this is the type of stone that Kephas or Peter was. When you look into the etymology of his name, you'll see that his name actually means to be a stone that's made smooth by the water running over it. Now, the brook speaks to living waters because the brook has moving water, which speaks to living waters, which also speak to the Ruach HaKodesh or the words of Yahushua. And then you have the stones themselves. And these stones, they actually speak to the hearts of the flesh. The hearts of the flesh are as these stones. And the shepherd's bag, this word bag is actually keely, and it means something prepared. It comes from Kala. Um, keely is number 3615. It comes from Kala, number 3615. Um, and it means to be finished, to be complete. Such as Yah's plan when, when Yahushua was on the torture stake, and he said, it is finished. You know, so you can put those stones, you can put your stones in that. In his new covenant that is completed, that is finished for our sake. The script speaks to a traveling pouch. See, and this is this is really revelatory because it doesn't make sense really to have two bags. The script is a is a traveling pouch, and the sling is a weapon. The sling speaks speaks to a weapon. And you work that weapon with your hand, and the hand speaks to the works of Elohim. Okay, now we're gonna um, uh -oh. we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna look at some some scriptural backing for for some of this, uh, for these things in Ezekiel thirty six twenty four through twenty seven. We see pretty much the same thing, you know. Uh, it says, "For I will take you from among." The heathen. You know, even as the Heavenly Father would take us from among the heathen, it, that's what it's talking about, and gather you out of all the countries, speaking of Israel, and bring you into your own land. Those of us who have been fathered from above, we have received our own land, have we not? It says, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. See, when he takes you from the heathen, the heathen is spoken of uh, uh, as the waters in which the beasts rise up out of. See, these are dirty waters. You know, um, Revelation 17, 15 says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sit of our peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. See, these are the waters that, we, that we're that we used to being in. But Yah says when he begins to gather us, that is when, he, when we're father from above, then he'll clean us with clean water. He'll put clean water upon you. He says in verse 36, 25 of Ezekiel, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. So in other words, all the things of this world, all the things of the flesh, uh, all the things of the heathens that we don't picked up along the way, he will cleanse us of. Verse 26 of Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you, hallelujah, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart, see how the stones represents the heart of flesh, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a, a, a heart of flesh. So he's going to take the stony heart that we were born with, and he's going to give us a heart of flesh, you know, a heart even for him. And he says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. See, that's the type of heart he's going to give us, even as the heart that was in our Messiah, Yahushua, which was to do everything that the Messiah, that the Heavenly Father said to do and to say only the things that the Heavenly Father told him to say. 
That's the type of heart that he's going to give us. He's going to replace that stony heart that we were born with with a heart of flesh that is after him. Now we're going to look, take a look at the same thing in the Brick Kadashah or the New Testament. It's just saying the same thing in a different way. In Yochanan 7, 37 through 39, it says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Yahushua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay, and it says, in verse 39, there's, there's a little footnote that kind of explains this. It says, But this spake he of the Ruach, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Ruach, for Ruach Kodesh had not, was not yet given because Yahushua was not yet glorified. So here it is again. We see how this thing's supposed to work. Yah, he, he calls us. He, he gathers us. Okay, and then he puts his waters, he let his, his rivers of waters, he let his living waters flow over us. And, and our stony hearts, you know, he begins to make them smooth with the water of his word. See, so here it is, we have a picture of some, someone coming unto Yah, and here it is, they're drinking this, this, uh, these living waters, and it's, and it's washing that heart. You know, the waters of the word goes on to wash the heart and, and make it smooth. You know, we read in Job 14, 19, it says, the waters wear the stones. You know, when you keep on putting this water in, it'll wear that, it, the water typifies the counsel. It typifies the counsel of, of our Messiah, Yahushua, the counsel of Elohim, if you would. And it wear the stones, the stones typify the hearts. So the more that you allow this water, the water of the word to wear the stones, to wear your heart, it says that thou washes away the things which grow of grow out of the dust of the earth. So the things of the flesh that's growing of his flesh, it will, will wash away. And it says, and thou destroyest the hope of man. So our hope will only be in him because the water of the word will wash away everything that is of the world. Ephesians 5.26 says that he did this, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. So we see the water typifies the word. As we put the word in, it will wash these stony hearts that we were born with. It will corrode these stony hearts. It will make them smooth. And eventually, Yah will give us that, that new heart. That is that heart that was, that was even as Yahushua's, that heart to do his will, to do his bidding, to keep walking his statutes and to keep his judgments and do it. See, and this is, this is what's entailed and David, taking his staff in his hand, he's taking, he's taking his teachings and instructions as a pupil, as a disciple of Yahushua. And he's taking that smooth, those smooth stones out of the brook. You know, I was just thinking about those five smooth stones and, and how the stones typified the heart. And how there was, there was five disciples who wrote 90 um, plus percent of... The brick Kadasha. You know, uh, Matthew, John, James, Peter, and, and Paul. You know, uh, 1 Samuel 17, 41 through 44 says, And the Philistines came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about, and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. See, the enemy look at us like we're no match for him. And that's a good thing. We, we want him to think that. Verse 43 says, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And that the Philistine and, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said unto David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. You know, so here it is. He's talking about his shepherd staff. You know, saying, you know, you're coming at me with sticks. You know, as if he was a dog. You know, a yard dog. An infidel. 1 Samuel 17, 45-51. And David 
And then said thou be to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of Yahuwah Zalaot, the Elohim of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. You know, so this is the way the enemy will come at us. He'll come at us, you know, physically speaking, he'll come at us with physical weapons, a sword, a spear, a shield. But spiritually speaking, he'll come at us with, with words of man. With prayers of, of men and with prayers to, to whatever God that they're serving. Whatever demon or devil that they're serving. Verse 46. This day will Yahuwah deliver thee into mine hand and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistine this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a Elohim in Israel. And all of this assembly shall know that Yahuwah saveth not with sword or spear. So you have to understand that we fight not against flesh and blood. We don't go and take literal swords and spears and, and go and try to do physical harm to people. That's not how we get down. That's not how we fight. We fight by being, with our shepherd staff, by being students of Yahushua, by following his lead. Even when he was being led to the slaughter, you know, he didn't lift a finger. He didn't even shout. You know, that's how we fight. Our fight looks quite a bit different, quite a bit different, and the, the enemy won't, won't understand what's going on. Even as Goliath didn't understand when David came out there with that shepherd staff. He's looking at the shepherd's staff and, 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 and didn't pay, take enough heed to that uh, sling that was in his hand. That spoke to those good works that he was doing. Verse 47, and all the assembly shall know that Yahuwah, oh I just said that. Verse 48, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. See, this is totally different. When, when everybody else seen Goliath, they ran away. But when David got on the battlefield with him and he came towards David, David hasted. He hurried up and ran towards him. He ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took this a stone. See, and this is what we have to do our works. We have to put our works into that bag, into that new covenant of Yahushua. And we got to take that stone, we got to take that stone, that heart that has been made smooth with the word of Elohim. And that's what we slang at the Philistines. We slang it at the Philistine in his forehead and it says the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. See, once we, we, this is how we defeat Goliath is by taking that stone that has been made smooth, that heart that has been made smooth, and we put it into the covenant of, of, of Yahushua, and we slain that at our enemy that's, that's, in, the, that's in the land, i.e., that's in our flesh. You know, this is, this is how we overcome the enemy. By acknowledging the covenant that we have made with Yah. By allowing his word to make our rough hearts smooth. And trust me, it will make it smooth. Because everything you think you want to do, that was other flesh that you used to do before you were father from above. His word will tell you, uh-uh. It'll wash that away. And after a while, so much stuff the way that you used to do, it, that, that heart of yours will be start to become smooth. And then that's what you take and you throw at Goliath, and it'll sink right in his head. It'll destroy him. You know, see, so we really destroy our spiritual enemy. We destroy it by, by actually adhering to Yah's word, staying in Yah's covenant, and acknowledging him in all our ways. You know, this is how we destroy the enemy, by really by just doing what we're supposed to do, taking care of the work within us, taking care of the work with the man in the mirror. This is really how we slay all the enemies in the land. This is how the giants fall before us. And it says, 
So David prevailed over the Philistines with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine. You know, so that, that's our weapon. That's, that's in the works of our hands. That's what we smite the, the Philistine with, with good works. We overcome evil with good. It says, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheep thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. See, they're a bunch of cowards themselves. Once their champion was down and out, the rest of them ran, killed the head, and, and the body were followed. You know, so here it is, we see David using the words of the Philistine, the sword, or the words of a of, of man against him. You know, I, I recall being in spiritual warfare trying to trying to free my mother from from uh, from an unclean spirit. And that's just how that's just how I defeated him too. With his own sword, with his own words. It was a spirit of divination and it was it was saying that this would happen and that would happen. And a lot of times it did. But not all the time. And that's where I got. Him. You know, and that's the thing with the enemy. You know, they're going to lie. Because their father is the father of lies. And that's how you catch them up. You use their own words. Verses 52 through 58, it says, And the men of Israel and Yahudah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharaim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. And when Shaul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son this striking is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Shaul and the head of the Philistine, uh, with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Shaul answered to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant, Yesi, the Bethlehem, Bethlehemite. Now, you know, that's the end of the chapter, but I just want to say one, one other thing because it's another important uh, matter to the spiritual warfare because after Goliath was destroyed, the number one enemy of the beloved, the number one enemy of the one that was followed from above, the one that was born again, the number one enemy became Shaul. The very one that he was fighting for. See, you start off fighting for your desires. But in the end, your desires begin to fight against you. See, and even though David would not slay Shaul, he would not kill his desires. His desires was trying to kill him. I hope you got that. You know, that's all I have for you, Dad. I pray it was a blessing unto you.